Well, hello and welcome to Bio 212. Um, we are continuing our discussion of Chapter 28 and we're now moving our focus to the female reproductive system here. And similar to the male reproductive system, what we're actually discussing are in fact the gonads, but inside females they are ovaries. Remember they stay internal inside the body, which is of course a significant difference, but if we put them side by side you'd probably taken by the fact that they too are ovular in structure and they're suspended by a series of ligaments to ensure that the development of the secondary oocyte will be made apparent or presented to the spermatocytes once entered into the female body. This happens because there's a series of uterine tubes on both the right and the left sides of the female that allow for the secondary oocyte to travel and we'll learn how that happens. Should fertilization take hold, it embeds in the most external lining of the uterus, meaning the internal luminal structure. You'll see what I mean by that when we come back to it. How the spermatocytes actually get in, of course, is they have to travel through the vagina. So we have to talk about how it is. Mother Nature has designed the tissues to allow for the actual depositing of the spermatocytes. The preparation of the vagina for that, Mother Nature creates a series of uh, tissue structures that we co collectively call the vulva and or attached to the pudendum, and this allows for the interaction between the male reproductive structure and the female reproductive structure. Um, and it has pretty much the same physical structure, even though they don't look the same. What I mean by that is Mother Nature controls bl flood, flooding of blood, blood flow, that's what I was trying to say, as well as tactile receptors, Piscinian corpuscles, that allow for the stimulation of the tissue to make sure that, you know, when we say that the tissue is prepared, what we actually mean is that there's sufficient lubrication to ensure that there's no tearing and the, mm, how do I say this, the, uh, mm, I think I'll just stop there for now. Um, unfortunately, your textbook doesn't develop memory glands probably as much as it should because inside chapter 29, where they do discuss this a little bit more, the interplay between fertilization of the products of the ovaries, meaning the actual secondary oocyte, there has to be a timing mechanism that will prepare now then the mammary glands should fertilization take hold implantation into the uterus the development of the fetal structure until birth occurs and then the actual functioning of these mammary glands themselves so that's a whole lot of talking and um i'm not i don't i don't i think people get sort of lost when they're doing that. So remember, I'm going to remind you one more time, you really should have read the textbook before you're listening to this. Um, hopefully that introduction helped make things a little bit make more sense. And now remember that I started off the male reproductive system or the entire reproductive channel by reminding you that the male reproductive system actually has the X and Y chromosomes. So therefore inside the back of your mind, you're remembering that all cells that we're actually talking about actually have two X chromosomes here so that everything we're talking about means this is the default pathway, which means we have no Mullerian inhibiting substance, which means there is no SRY gene. Okay, so everything we're about to discuss is its own series of transcription and translation reactions inside each of the individual cells to ensure that the outcome is appropriate. Okay, so let's move on. So here's a mid-sagittal dissection of one, a cartoon, but also here a female uh, cadaver structure. And you can see here what you're actually looking at is the bladder, which is anterior to the uterus. And even though you can't see it, more laterally you can actually see the um, actual um, suspensory ligaments that are holding now this ovary in place. And you actually have the fimbria, which is going to be attached to an oviduct, which will then allow for them to travel to the actual uterus here. You can see it better inside the cartoon here. Here's the ovary. There's the fimbria. You're going to collect and 
expelled secondary oocyte into the ductal structure, which will then deposit it inside here, um, inside the innermost luminal surface of the uterus. Okay, You'll see that this is primarily a smooth muscle structure with an outer connective tissue layer and an inner endothelial cell population. It opens up here to the cervix, and the cervix is, of course, the beginning or the end part portion, depending on how you look at it, of the vagina here. And there's the opening of the vagina right there, where you actually have the pudendum up here made up of the external folds of tissue. Okay, so what are those ovaries? They're paired glands of homologous structures to that of the testes. That's what I was trying to tell you a few minutes ago. Um, they make gametes and those gametes again are going to have to be haploid structures right yeah i think there's some i think i get nervous while i'm doing these things switch letters around all the time anyway um, beyond that it's going to of course create hormones and you're going to notice the list of hormones here is greater than that of the male reproductive system okay so the Ovaries will make progesterone, estrogens, inhibin, relaxin. There are some more hormones that are going to be made here indirectly as well. I mentioned a moment ago that we actually hold all of these structures in place, and they're held in place by ligaments, which means it's connective tissue to connective tissue. Okay. And when you're looking at this, what's happened is they've done a transverse plane here through a non-anatomically correct placed female, right? And you can see there's the bladder, and you can see here is the uterus itself. The actual digestive structures have been reflected out of the way here, and you can see there is the ovary. Once expelled, secondary oocyte will be collected into the fallopian or, ovary or uterine tube, right, on either side, and it's going to be deposited inside this structure. So, if we take a look at the, his, the histology of this, we're going to work through all of these in a moment, right? And what I want you to understand is that as we're going through this, this is an ideal representation of a pathway that begins in utero. Okay, so before, literally before your reproductive system is told to become a reproductive system, many of these steps are actually occurring in place. And what I mean by that is the ovary itself, these primordial fo follicles, they're formed in utero, inside the fetus. They become dormant for a period of time. A subset of them will become pri primary follicles. These will then develop into secondary follicles. And you'll notice what's happening here is the follicle is a membrane-bound structure with something inside of it. This something inside of it is the oocyte. And this again is a haploid structure, which means we have to introduce the concept of meiosis again. So when we're looking at this, what I want you to appreciate is there's no fluid here, no fluid there, no fluid here. It means these cells inside here, okay, inside here will actually make fluid that creates the secondary follicle. And as it matures, it becomes the graphene follicle. And you'll see that this population of cells surrounding it actually will ensure that at expulsion, it can break off and now exit. This is what I mean by that expulsion that will be collected by the fimbria into the uterine tube. Your textbook says something along the lines of discharging secondary oocyte. Make it sound like uh, one of the space shuttles um, from Star Trek or something. And here's where things get interesting, and students often overlook this. This entire structure, all of these follicles, when Mother Nature makes a follicle, there's an investment in energy and infrastructure here. And what's going to happen is that follicle continues to have a responsibility. It's going to continue to make hormones. So the corpus luteum that I'm circling here actually is still making hormones. And should fertilization occur, it will maintain the endothelium of the uterus such that the developing fertilized structure can survive. Should that not happen, what happens is the corpus luteum will now begin to degenerate such that it becomes this thing that's called the corpus albicans. Now you'll notice that this is picture perfect and it's a cartoon and you look over here and you're like, I can't make any of that out. 
inside lab, if you're fortunate enough to get a cat uterus, you'll be able to see a cat uterus with cat ovaries. You'll be able to see all of these structures. If you get the human, you probably won't be able to see too much of this because it's much harder. Okay. So, again, we have to talk about what oogenesis is or oogenesis and follicular development. It's the formation of the gametes. It begins before females are born, which means we actually have to have the same steps of meiosis that we have for spermatogenesis. And essentially, you're going to have germ cells differentiate into oogonia, okay, which are diploid cells. What's going to happen is they become arrested, okay? Um, your textbook sort of skips over for this a little bit, but they do focus on the fact that many of these stem cells will degenerate, okay? And what's going to happen is because they're arrested at meiosis 1, okay, 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 what's going to happen here is they actually end up going through a series of reductions. So at birth, you may have upwards of 2 million follicular cells. By the time you actually get to puberty, okay, whenever you went through puberty, okay, you might have, that's supposed to be 4,000 or 40,000, okay, I don't remember, I'm just going to put another one of those in there and see what happens, who corrects me inside class, okay, and at the end, by the time you actually begin going through puberty to menarche, you're going to actually end up with 400 ovulations that will produce a productive secondary oocyte that is capable of undergoing fertilization. Okay, so just like the cartoon I drew for you guys before, again, here is the brain, here's a cerebellum back there, here's a pons, here's a medulla, here's a spinal column, we're going to put a pituitary gland, anterior, posterior, and just like we saw before, we have to have gonadotrophic releasing hormone utilizing the a hypophyseal portal system. Now targeting the gonadotrophs, the gonadotrophs will release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, okay? And what's going to happen is it drives the development of many of these primordial fol follicles, okay? But what, it's a dose-dependent response. So only one will get a high concentration. Some will get less and less. And that's what actually causes the timing, as far as we understand. And the, those primordial follicles become primary fo follicles. They become surrounded by these granulosal cells. You'll see both here and inside, um, what do you call it, lab. And what's going to happen is you eventually form this thing that's called a zona pellucida around it which is going to actually begin to protect the development of all of these cells. You're going to have these things that are called theca folliculi, and these are really important because the theca folliculi are going to make estrogens. And those estrogens drive now the actual development. Okay, That's right here. The theca differentiates into the interna secreting estrogens and the theca externa. These estrogens will drive metabolism. Okay. So you get more FSH and LH, therefore you get more estrogens, therefore you actually drive the actual development of that follicle. And of course inside that follicle is our oocyte. Okay. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Let's get rid of this. Sorry about that. Let's go like that. Let's go like this. Oh, where'd you go? Okay, so here you go. So notice there's no fluid inside this space. Here's the primary oocyte, okay? And you're going to see as it goes, the primary, the primordial follicle here is going to differentiate into, notice all these granulosal cells inside of this space here. Here you actually have fecal folliculi cells outside here. Increase the concentration, so let's go like this. Arrow up, arrow up for FSH. Oops, it's supposed to be an F. FSH and LH, arrow up, LH, and you're pushing the development of all of this. These follicular cell, these fecal cells out here are going to increase now the amount of estrogen. Whoops, I always do that, I don't know why. So let's just go like this, take advantage of it. Increase estrogen, E stands for estrogen here. And now what's going to happen, of course, is 
you're going to now, of course, increase the amount of fluid because who remembers what the waste products of metabolism are? It's carbon dioxide and water. Well, guess what? This is a lot of water here. So let's get rid of all of this. Let's get rid of that. If we can. Well, I don't think we can. So let's go like that. Okay. And now let's see what happens. We're going to increase just a little bit of fluid inside here. By the time we get to that mature graphene follicle here, you're going to see that now you've created this zona pellucida, which is a hardened glycoprotein structure with a series of receptors on them. You actually have the corona radiata, which is a series of granulosal cells that are going to protect this. Remember, this is a three-dimensional structure. You have this stalk. You have a stalk so that when this ruptures, it can break free of just these few cells here. Imagine you actually had the surface area holding onto all of this. It wouldn't work out so well. So what's going to happen is, let's go back, let's get out of here. Let's make sure you understand what we're talking about. Take a look here. As this develops, the pressure will now push this secondary oocyte out because it's actually gotten close enough to the ovarian germinal ep epithelium here. Okay. So what's actually happening? So in this next few minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the similarities and differences between oogenesis and spermatogenesis. And you're going to notice in fetal development, meiosis one begins and notice it arrests after puberty, primary oocytes complete meiosis one. Pay attention to that, which produces a secondary oocyte. And notice it makes this thing that's called a polar body. What's different here is mother nature is selectively reducing the amount of cytoplasm available to one secondary oocyte. Okay, the secondary oocyte is now going to begin meiosis two, so it's going to actually finish this. Okay, now you're going to notice if you counted these things, you should have three polar bodies: one, two, three. Okay, and what's going to happen is you now have one secondary oocyte. We're going to call an ovum, and if fertilization occurs, it will complete meiosis two. If fertilization occurs, okay? And now you actually have a two end structure, and that's when we call it a zygote because now it is diploid. Dip. Oh, no. Oops, it's supposed to be an I. Sorry about that. And that is an exclamation mark. Okay. So there's some major differences here. Mother Nature says, I'm going to sacrifice three quarters of the genetic potential, give one of those, all of the cytoplasm to ensure that one will survive, and it times it. Okay. Notice there's a specific timing process here. Okay, because as this is happening, notice that secondary oocyte is stuck inside one of those follicles. And maybe one of those follicles never matures, and therefore none of this would actually ever happen, right? Because fertilization is only going to occur when. Okay, cool. I hope you get that. I'll definitely go over it in class again, though. Okay, so this is what Mother Nature is doing, right? There's a fetal period to this, and in that fetal period, you actually will arrest things. And you notice in this part of your textbook, it tells you it arrests at prophase one of meiosis one. Okay. And then you actually will break out of this and notice this is where we're actually putting it inside the follicle. As meiosis one is completing, now you're going to go meiosis two. Okay. And you're going to see here that that secondary oocyte here says it's arrested in metaphase two. And another part in your textbook, it will say it's arrested in anaphase two. Doesn't really matter. Okay, what does matter is that at fertilization, you're now going to have a mechanism that will allow for the 23 chromosomes from our sperm cell and our 23 chromosomes inside of our ovum to now make one, two, N structure. Okay, it's supposed to be one, one, two, N structure. That's important. Okay, so, so far we've introduced the female reproductive system. We've gotten through just a touch of hormonal regulation, and now we've gotten to the fact that fertilization is required for the finishing of oogenesis and follicular development.